Hello, and welcome to lecture nine, where we're going to talk about magnetic forces on moving charges. Okay? So, this is our ninth lecture because we spent the first eight lectures introducing electricity. We had static charges, we had moving charges, which created an electric current. Now, we're adding to the story of electricity by introducing magnetism. We're going to see how magnetism interacts with charge, why, why magnetism is fundamentally different from charge, and eventually, in two chapters, we will see how magnetism and electricity are closely connected, okay? i really starting in one chapter, so that would be lecture 11, but building on that idea throughout the next two chapters, okay? Let's take a look at our objectives. We want to understand the meaning of magnetism permanent magnets, and some of its initial differences with electricity. And I will continue to build on these ideas. We want to learn the fundamental particle of magnetism is the magnetic dipole, okay? We want to learn that a magnet's field strength can be measured with a test charge, must much like the electric field, but that that test charge must be in motion with a component perpendicular to the field. So definitely some more details are necessary. And we want to extend the ideas of magnetic force on moving charges to current carrying wires and to square loops of current carrying wire, okay, which will create magnetic torques. Okay, so let's let's get to the key terms and then we'll go from there. Okay, so what is a permanent magnet? Well, it's like a bar magnet, refrigerator magnet. That's what we mean by a permanent magnet. It is created by something called magnetic domains inside the magnet where atoms have electrons that are mostly aligned, okay? The stronger the magnet, the better the alignment, okay? So it all has to do with electrons that are aligned in their motion, okay? And only insulators can be permanent magnets, and most materials have randomly oriented electrons, thus they can't be permanent magnets, because if they're randomly oriented, that means no permanent magnet. You have to have that general alignment. Now, there's some unanswered questions here. Why do electrons create magnets? Well, we'll talk about the creation of magnetic fields in lecture 10. For now, we're instead focusing on what do magnetic fields do to charges? So you can really think of this lecture as answering the question of how, you know, the, the, the what as well, you know, what do they do? Magnetic fields, what do they do? And in lecture 10, we'll talk more about the why. Why do magnetic fields exist at all? But I want to start with the what and how of magnetic fields because it's directly going to tie in to current and moving charges, things we've already seen in those first eight lectures. Okay? All right. So the magnetic dipole, this thing that is a good approximation of the fundamental particle of, of magnetism. Okay? So it is a magnet with a north and a south end. Okay, like this bar magnet shown in the picture. Okay, that's an example, a large one, but that's an example of magnetic dipole. If you have an atom, all right, with a positive nucleus and an electron, and that electron is essentially an orbit around the nucleus, then that will also create a dipole. All right, that will create a dipole with a north and a south end as well. That's a much smaller dipole. All right, and that's that. That's what magnetism is about. is all about individual dipoles at the microscopic level. Okay, magnets only exist as dipoles. Okay, and an electron or other charged particle moving in a circular path creates a magnetic dipole at the smallest scale, the fundamental scale. And when I say that magnets only exist as dipoles, case in point. Look what happens when we cut a bar magnet, a large magnetic dipole, in half. We get two smaller magnetic dipoles. And you can obviously continue to do that until you get down to the atomic scale. Okay? But you can never cut them so much that you can get an individual pole. You can't just get the south by itself or the north. Because magnetic monopoles, mono meaning one, they don't exist. There is no magnetic monopole. Magnets always come in pairs of north and south poles, okay? Since magnetism is not an intrinsic property of particles, okay, like charge is, there is no particle that is magnetic. There's no magnetic monopole. There's no particle that carries charge, like an electron carries charge or a proton carries charge. 
That's not what magnetism is, okay? All right, that begs the question, what is it? And we'll talk a bit how moving charge can create it, but then that also leaves questions unanswered, which will eventually lead to this idea of electromagnetism, that electricity and magnetism are united as a single force, and that an electromagnetic wave is light, which will then finally, finally get us on to our next topic, discussing light, okay? But back to magnetism, okay? So magnetic field lines, what are those? Well, we've talked about electric field lines. I want you to, to remember everything you remember that about electric field lines, because magnetic field lines are gonna operate in a very similar way. They follow the same rules as electric field lines. Right? What were those rules? Well, when field lines are closer together, that's a strong region of the field. When they're far apart, that's a, we a weaker or weak region of the field, okay? And that would be for electric field lines, absolutely. But here, we're not talking about electric field lines. We're talking about magnetic field lines. And we reuse the letter B, uppercase, to denote the magnetic field, okay? Magnetic field lines always point towards the south pole, right? In a similar way to electric field lines that always point towards electrons, to negative charge, okay? Not necessarily electrons, but they always point to negative charge, electric field lines. Likewise, or in a similar way, magnetic field lines always point towards a south pole, like the one shown here in the bar magnet, or this one shown in the giant bar magnet inside Earth, okay? All right, so that's, that's their direction, their directionality. Unlike electric field lines, magnetic field lines are force divided by charge and velocity. Because if you recall, the idea of the electric field line was that it was Newton's per coulomb. I, I often describe that as force normalized by charge. Well, here, this is force normalized, which means divided, by charge and velocity. So definitely different units, okay? All right, the magnetic field has units of Teslas. We'll talk about that in the key equations, okay? And magnetic field lines never terminate, okay? So these are two big differences between magnetic field lines and electric field lines, because otherwise they have a lot of similarities, right? But a big difference between them are, is the following, the units and the fact that magnetic field lines never terminate. What does that mean they never terminate? Well, if you think of electric field lines and they, they come to an electron and those field lines terminate the electron, they approach that electron, it is a field line sink. They all sink into that single point, okay? Whereas of course a proton or a positive charged particle is a electric field source. All the lines radiate away from it. But magnetic field lines actually continue because since there is no monopole, there's no particle for them to finish off at, they instead have to exist in loops. So if we consider the field lines inside a bar magnet, they continue through the bar magnet, like so, completing a loop. For example, completing this loop here, okay? Going in this direction, towards the south pole, okay? Then going through the magnet, passing to the north pole, and then back out to loop around to the south pole, okay? Good. Okay, so what about Earth's magnetic field? Well, the Earth has a magnetic field that behaves almost like there is a giant bar magnet inside the planet, okay? The magnetic field is created by the free charge inside the core, so that's the molten, mostly iron core of the planet, and the rotation of the planet, okay? So that's, that's the necessary ingredients to create the moving charge that creates the magnetic field. Again, more on that in later lectures and chapters, okay? But the point being that it's, a, it's created by charge inside of the planet, okay? There's certain, certain necessary ingredients that a planet seems to need in order to have a strong magnetic field, and our terrestrial planet meets those necessary ingredients, okay? Now, if we remember the rules of magnetic field lines, we see that the magnetic field lines go from north to south, okay? So all the field lines are pointing towards the south magnetic pole. So let's think about a compass. Well, a compass shows a permanent magnet, a bar magnet, that aligns itself with the Earth's magnetic field, with the north pole of the bar magnet attracted to Earth's magnetic south pole. Well, that means that when we look at a compass and we see the north end of that compass, and the north end of the bar magnet is denoted on the bar magnet, as N on the compass. So there's consistency there. In other words, N on the compass matches up with a north end on the bar magnet, okay? A bar magnet that you might not be using as a compass, for example, 
Okay, I bring that up because let's think about it. That means that the north end, okay, it points towards the geographic north. But if it's pointing to the geographic north, that means it must be aligning itself with the field, the field that points to, yep, a magnetic south. So as you already saw perhaps in the picture, the north geographic pole is a south magnetic pole, okay? But that, that allows for magnets to always have their north end pointing north, geographically north at least, okay? And again, just to be clear, that's because opposite poles attract and like poles repel, right? So if I take two south poles of a magnet and I try to push them against each other, they will repel each other. Likewise, of two north poles. But a north and south pole are attracted like the north pole of the bar magnet in the compass and Earth's south pole. They're attracted to each other. That's how you, you get your bearing with the compass, okay? And of course, this idea of opposites attracting and likes repelling is the same for charges, another similarity with charges, okay? So quite a few differences, but some good things to leverage as far as similarities, okay? And a fun fact that the North Pole is a South Magnetic Pole. So one of the big things we're gonna be doing in this chapter in the computation questions to follow is talking about magnetic force. Okay, so what is magnetic force? Well, is the force exerted on a charged particle moving through a magnetic field, okay? The magnetic force magnitude is dependent on the charge of the particle, the speed of the particle, and the direction of the moving particle relative to the field lines. So a lot of things we need to know about the particle in, in, in order to actually know the value of the magnetic force in Newtons. Okay, and this is an example of a helical path taken by a charged particle inside a magnetic field. The reason that charged particle is taking this, fat, this path is due to the forces exerted by the field on the charged particle, okay? The reason the path is helical has to do with the direction of the charged particle relative to the magnetic field. It's also po possible for a charged particle to have a perfectly circular path that will be planar rather than three-dimensional. And we'll talk about that in two of the examples. In fact, the first two examples when we get to the practice problems. But here's an example of the resulting motion that is a consequence of the magnetic force on a moving charged particle. Okay, well, let's get down to the key equations, which will also involve this little picture called the right-hand rule. Okay, oh, well, after I introduce the right-hand rule, of course. The direction of the magnetic force is found with the right-hand rule, and here it is. It's called the right-hand rule because you use your right hand, okay? And you use your right hand in the following way. Your thumb points in the direction of the velocity of the moving particle. Your index finger points in the direction of the magnetic field, and the resulting force on the moving charge particle is shown by the direction of your middle finger when it's held perpendicular to the plane of your hand. You could also think of your palm pointing in the direction of force, like so, okay? But that direction is, I feel, best represented by the middle finger pointing so, okay? That's the right hand rule, and it can be used to find the direction of the magnetic field if you know the force and the velocity, or the velocity if you know the magnetic field and the force, or whatever is your unknown direction. As long as you know two, you can find the third using the right-hand rule. The velocity here is also the direction of the current. This is current as a vector, okay? All right. So note, zero magnetic force is exerted on neutral particles. So particles that have no net charge don't experience a force in a magnetic field. Particles at rest, okay? and particles moving on magnetic field lines, okay? So moving parallel to magnetic field lines. All right, should say on right here, moving on magnetic field lines, or along, okay? All right, and that is represented in the equation, okay? This is the magnetic force measured in Newtons. This is the charge of the particle that the force is exerted on. This is the velocity of that particle. This is the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field, okay? So we see this is sine of that angle in the equation. Well, now we see this idea of particles moving on magnetic field lines. 
because if the velocity and the magnetic field vector are parallel, then the angle between them would be zero degrees. And sine of zero degrees gives us zero. Sine of zero degrees is zero, which means our force would be zero, okay? In other words, particles that move parallel to magnetic field lines feel no force. And then, of course, the magnetic field is represented by the letter B, and that is measured in the unit Tesla, okay? Tesla. And the Tesla, we can see, is the Newton over Coulomb over meters per second, because it's force divided by charge divided by velocity. That's the Tesla, okay? But it's a named derived unit. Good. Okay? Now, our next equation is closely related to that, and it has to do with a common type of resulting motion of charged particles in uniform and constant magnetic fields, which is the type of fields we're going to be talking about in this lecture. Uniform and constant magnetic fields, unchanging in time and uniform over space. Okay? And that resulting motion is none other than circular motion. All right? So this is magnetic force as a centripetal force, with R being, well, M being the mass of the particle, and R representing the radius of the circular trajectory. So why would the magnetic force act as a centripetal force? Well, in fact, it acts as a very natural centripetal force because the magnetic field, we can see, exerts a force on a charged particle moving with velocity v that is always perpendicular to both the field and the velocity. Perpendicular to the field and the velocity. Well, if you, I have a force that's perpendicular to my velocity, and you think, of, you think of the velocity as being, say, tangential, then you can think of the force as being radial, because, of course, the tangential direction is perpendicular to the radial direction. And now you have yourself a circle. And that force will, by definition and physical reality, always remain perpendicular to the velocity. So it naturally behaves as a centripetal force, because the centripetal force always points to the center of the circle, and it's always perpendicular to the tangential direction, okay? So that's, that's a really amazing thing about the magnetic force, is it naturally creates circular motion, okay? The electric force had no, no such phenomenon, so it's, so it's such an interesting reality here, okay? And then our last version of this magnetic force equation involves current, all right? And this is magnetic force on a current carrying wire. So instead of considering the velocity of a particle, instead we're going to consider the current in a wire, measurement amps, and the length of that wire. Because longer wires experience a greater total force, magnetic force that is. Okay? All right. And then here, theta is very similar, but now of course it's the angle between I and B as shown as in the right hand rule picture instead of the angle between V and B because the vector that has replaced the velocity vector is the current vector, okay? Now, you might recall that current refers to the direction of positive charge carriers. So that means that this velocity must also refer to the velocity of positive charge carriers. Indeed, that's true. This right-hand rule applies to positive charge. We'll talk about what to do with negative charge in just a few moments, okay? So now let's consider this idea of a wire with some current, but forming that wire into a loop. And for clarity and ease of understanding, it's good to consider that loop as a rectangle or even a square, okay? Because the shape doesn't matter, but it's good for derivation purposes and simple understanding purposes to think of current flowing through a wire that is a rectangle. This case is a rectangle with sides A and B, okay? So what happens when a magnetic field is perpendicular to the normal direction of that wire, we or that area enclosed by the wire, there is a torque, okay? There's a torque that's exerted. And we can determine that that torque must be there by just thinking about the right-hand rule and segments of wire. Because if we could, for example, just consider this segment of wire and do the right-hand rule, we will see that there is a force that is exerted on the wire, okay? There's a force that is exerted on the wire. You can even consider it over here with the magnetic field moving to the right, the resulting force pointing up, 
and the direction of the current flow here denoted as coming out of the page. And I'll talk about this notation in just a moment, okay? And when we do that, when we consider the combined forces and torque relative to the center of the, um, the enclosed area, so torque, of course, being a you know the rotational equivalent of force and always being relative to some rotational axis. In this case, the rotational axis will always be the center, always be the center, okay? Then we end up with the following equation for torque, magnetic torque, okay? Magnetic fields can exert torque on any closed wire loop with current. If there's no current, then, of course, there'll be no force because there's no charge, okay? The form of that equation is torque tau equals magnetic field strength times current times enclosed area by the wire loop times sine of the angle theta. But what is theta in this case? Because there's more than one wire, right? Well, let's see, okay? So magnetic force measured in Newton meters, magnetic torque, excuse me, measured in Newton meters, the enclosed area of the loop, square meters, and then theta, the angle between the n vector and the magnetic field vector. Well, n is the normal vector. n could be drawn like this, okay? It is the vector that points away from the area, okay? Because normal vectors, on a, if you think of it, them as a, in the case of mechanics, a normal vector points away from a surface, okay? It's normal to the surface. Here, there's not really a surface, there's an enclosed area, but that is being treated like a surface and the normal vector points perpendicular to that surface, it's normal. Okay, all right, and so then that's that angle theta, the angle between the magnetic field and the normal vector. So let's consider then when there's no torque and when there's maximum torque. Well, in this case, if we consider that this loop is in the plane of the page, okay, and the magnetic field is also in the plane of the page but pointing to the right, then we see that there is a torque in this case because the angle between the normal vector, which would be coming out of the page, and the magnetic field, that angle theta would be 90 degrees, okay? In this case, we can see that theta is something less than 90 degrees, okay? So theta is less than 90 degrees, which means the torque would have decreased. If this current carrying loop was completely perpendicular to the magnetic field so that the normal vector was parallel to the magnetic field vector, well, in that case, theta would be zero and sine of theta would give you zero. So there would be no torque when the current carrying loop is oriented in such a way that its normal vector is parallel to the magnetic field vector, okay? So those are the cases of maximum torque and zero torque, all right? Okay, and we can um, rewrite this expression to include loops that have more than one loop of wire. So you, you think of this as just a single wire that's been bent into a rectangle, but what about if you have many loops stacked on top of each other, okay? Well, then n is the number of loops, okay? The number of loops. I should have added, added that label in there, okay? Okay, and last, we can rewrite this with a particular substitution, just an just a expression called mu, and mu is the magnetic moment, okay? The magnetic moment is equal to, well, you can see, IAN, okay? And as such, it has units of amps times square meters. That's the magnetic moment, okay? Now, a little note about notation. So notice in this picture, the um, from the side view, this one here, the current was shown to be either coming out of the page or going into the page. And that's because we often have to consider these three-dimensional situations because obviously the right-hand rule gives us vectors in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. And one of the ways we draw that besides using a kind of perspective three-dimensional um, axis system Okay, which would be which I which will also be done something like x, y, and z, but often that's not going to be convenient in our sketches and our drawings, and such and as such we're going to use notation where a vector that goes into the page 
is shown like this, a circle with an X in the middle, and a vector that's coming out of the page is shown as a circle with a dot in the middle. You could think of these as arrows, with these being the fletching at the end of the arrow, and this being the tip of the arrow. Okay, so now let's get to our practice problems. We have four types of practice problems. Type one, problems that involve a charged particle moving through a magnetic field and may involve uniform circular motion, because I said naturally the magnetic field force is a, a centripetal force. Okay, so these are pretty straightforward problems, exactly what you expect from the title of the lecture. Type two, fairly complex problems that involve a charged particle moving through an electric field and a magnetic field. Okay, so what happens when there's both present? Because we already know what to do with forces exerted on charged particles in an electric field, so we should be able to combine the two. Type three, problems that involve a current carrying wire in a magnetic field may involve the mass of the wire and gravity, okay? So this is replacing that moving single charged particle with a current carrying wire, naturally, okay, looks good. Type four, fairly complex problems that involve a current carrying loop of wire in a magnetic field and the resulting torque. So that would be using these last three equations, okay? So let's take a look at our practice problems. But first, a few concept questions, because there are a lot of new concepts now that we've moved from electricity to magnetism. Okay, question one. What happens if you bring a permanent bar magnet in close to a conducting sphere with two strips of foil attached at the bottom? This is called an electrograph, okay? Now, we know what happens, or you may recall what happens, if we say bring a charged sphere in, right? If I bring a positively charged sphere, then I'm going to induce a charge, even if I don't touch the, the uh, electrograph, I'm gonna induce a charge of negative charge on this end, if I'm inducing negative charge up here, that means I'm leaving a deficit of negative charge down at the foil on the bottom. That means the foil will have positive charge left over due to the lack of electrons, which means the two foil tabs get repelled away from each other because of the repulsion of like charges. And so you can see, you'll see the gold foil actually push apart, okay? So that's the behavior for electrostatics. But what about for magnetics, magnostatics, right? Does anything happen? No, nothing will happen. If I bring the bar magnet in and I just hold it here, if I hold it at rest, then nothing will happen. Unlike when I hold the positive or negatively charged sphere at rest and I permanently see bending of the foil tabs, okay, at the bottom or the foil strips, not so if I just hold the magnet at rest, nothing happens. Okay, that's really indicative of the difference between electricity and magnetism. The charges at rest would remain at rest, okay? As because we know only moving charges experience a magnetic, magnetic force. And although there definitely is a magnetic field being created by this bar magnet, all the charges at rest inside the conducting sphere just remain at rest, okay? But what if I'm moving the magnet? Because in that, in that case, if I'm moving the magnet, or even as I move the magnet into its position shown in the picture, well, that means that the magnetic field must have been moving relative to the charges, which is effectively the same as the charges moving relative to the magnetic field. So they must have experienced a force as I brought the magnet in, right? And that's true. As the magnet is moved, some of the charges would experience a force, but the current would be chaotic and would definitely not cause any motion in the strips, okay? There's what's called eddy currents. So there is some currents. There could, act, there could be de detection of actual heat being released. From the from the sphere, if the magnet is moved very quickly or it's a very strong magnet, but not but not any actual coordinated you know um, charge being deposited or removed from one part of the electrograph. Okay, all right. And some of these ideas, especially the ideas of the moving magnet, will be discussed in later lectures. Okay. So now let's get, let's get back to magnets at rest. Okay. So a compass is placed at the black dot. So imagine you're taking a compass, you know, one of these compasses here, and you're just moving it in to the location of the black dot. If that's the case, if you do that, in which direction will the compass point? Okay, so make sure you can answer this, right? And on all these concept questions, answer them, pause the video if you need to, before you listen to my answer, okay? So let's see. Well, this is the magnetic field, okay? Pointing away from north, going to south, right? The magnetic field lines never terminating, okay? Within the magnet, they kind of go from south to north, but outside of the magnet, which is what we care about, they always go from north to south, okay? And then we consider, okay, well, that means that our black dot is in a region where the magnetic field is pointing to the right, which means 
that case B, okay? The magnet would get aligned with the field, which means the north end of the magnet, the, cut, the shaded end, north end over here, would point this way. So B is the correct answer, okay? Let's take a look at the next one. A compass is placed at the black dot. In which direction will the compass point? Make sure you can answer this, or at least you have a good guess for yourself. All right, let's see. All right, so there's the field lines, which means that A is the correct answer. Because again, the compass is aligning itself with the magnetic field, which means the north end would have to point this way. Okay, all right, let's do it one last time. A compass is placed at the black dot. In which direction will the compass point? Okay, let's consider the field lines. So these are two bar magnets here in the left section, all the field lines point straight up. Then when we get to the right sec section, they suddenly point straight down, okay? Which means if we place a magnet at the black dot, well, yep, D, aligning itself in the magnetic field. Okay, another, another uh, question about compasses. And this is the idea that if you look at a compass, sometimes you'll notice that the compass isn't exactly level in the fluid that, that the uh, bar magnet is suspended in. It wants to dip down, okay? Well, that dipping of the magnet is due to the fact that the field lines are not exactly parallel to Earth's surface. In fact, the only place where they're very close to parallel would be the equator. And of course, at the North Pole, the field lines are almost pointing straight down because they're going down into the Earth to complete the magnetic field line loop, okay? Consider the picture on the, you know, on the key terms page of this lecture. Okay, so if you then think of places where you would see very little dip or a lot of dip, okay? Well, the equator and a place like Ecuador would be a place where the, the compass would essentially float exactly level. But a place where the compass would actually dip down and touch the chamber, right, kind of probably inhibiting the functionality of the compass, well, that would be a place like the North Pole, okay? All right because there the magnetic field lines of Earth's magnetic field are almost vertical relative to the surface of Earth at the North Pole. All right, finally, let's do some actual computational examples. Example one, electrons trapped in the upper atmosphere, upper atmosphere create the aurora borealis, known as the northern lights, okay? There's also southern lights. If we assume that these electrons are trapped in perfect circular paths by the Earth's magnetic field, with a magnetic field strength of 13.4 microteslas, that's kind of an estimate of the magnetic field strength. It's a very weak field, okay? Which rate, uh, with radii of 3.84 meters, then how much kinetic energy does each electron possess in electron volts? So how do we go about answering this? Well, we need to start with our equation for the centripetal motion caused by the magnetic field force, okay? So here is the magnetic field. We're gonna treat it as a centripetal force, okay? Which means we're just going to set the force equal to mass times centripetal acceleration, okay? And here, I've just shown the actual algebraic step of isolating the velocity, okay? I'm gonna solve for the velocity. So when we solve for the velocity, we end up with charge, radius of the circular path, magnetic field strength divided by mass of the particle. In this case, we're talking about electrons, okay? Notice that one of the Vs canceled out, so we're just left with just V to the what to the first power, okay? So then we can go ahead and plug in our quantities, charge of an electron, all right? Radius that was given to us, magnetic field strength of the Earth also given, mass of an electron, something you would look up. And we end up with nine million meters per second, which of course is very fast, but not that fast for electrons. Fast, but certainly not relativistically, relativistically fast or anything, okay? Then we want to convert that to kinetic energy and specifically in electron volts, which you remember is the kinetic energy that's useful for small quantities of energy. All right, let me just orient the page there. Okay. So the kinetic energy of this electron with this particular radius in this particular field is one half mv squared, having solved for the velocity. We can then plug everything in. Um, and excuse me here, the velocity ended up get, getting jarbled, garbled. I have to uh, rewrite it and, and put this squared in there because there should be a squared, okay? And then this business in the denominator is the conversion factor because of course, one half mv squared when the mass is in kilograms and the velocity is in meters per second, as it is, would give us units of joules, but then we wanna convert those joules to electron volts, which is exactly what I've done here. And this is the conversion factor from joules to electron volts. All right, okay, good. Because every joule is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 electron volts. 
So we end up with 233 electron volts. Very good. Okay. All right. Example two. In reality, so this is building on, off example one, the electrons do not cross the electric field exactly perpendicular to the field lines. So the resulting path of the electrons is helical. Okay, because essentially there's there's a component of the velocity that is uh, that is parallel to the magnetic field that is being unaffected. Okay, so there's always going to be there'll always be this centripetal acceleration, but there's also going to be a translation that is perpendicular to kind of the plane of progressing circular motion, and that makes that helical path, like in the picture, in the key equations. Okay, or key terms. All right. So if the electrons have a velocity of, in this case, we're not solving for the velocity, but instead of being given it, 1.1 times 10 to the 7 meters per second, so about 11, meter, 11 million meters per second, and cross the Earth's magnetic field, same value, at an angle of 60 degrees, so, right, so instead of 90 degrees, 60 degrees, then what is the resulting radius of the electron's helical path? So the idea here is if we, if we just considered the velocity and we considered the angle with the magnetic field, then we can say, okay, well, there's going to be some component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity. That's the component we care about. Now, there's also going to be a component of the magnetic field that's parallel to the velocity that has no effect on the moving charge particle. Okay? No force from the parallel component. And we could have instead, of course, thought of splitting the velocity in the components, but the result is the same. Okay? So we're going to rewrite the magnetic centripetal force with the angle theta. So we're just going to take the equation like this one up here and just rewrite it to include theta. So it becomes this. Notice that in the key equations, I gave you the formula assuming that theta was 90 degrees, so the sine term was not there at all. But we can easily incorporate it like so. Okay? And then we simply solve for the radius. All right, we have one cancellation of one of the values of velocity. So then our expression for radius is mass times velocity divided by charge times magnetic field times sine of the angle between the velocity and the field. All right, theta, in this case, 60 degrees. Plug in our values, okay, and we get 5.4 meters. It has a larger circle. It's a larger circle because it's effectively a weaker force that's acting on the particle. Weaker force means bigger circle, okay? All right. It's also faster, so that, that does contribute. Because remember, up here, we got something that was a little bit slower, right? A difference between 9 millimeters per second and 11 millimeters per second. But the, the main difference between, for the, the main reason for the larger radius is due to the weaker effective force due to the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. All right. So here's another question. Um, these, this would actually be uh, questions uh, like 5 and 6, right? They're, they're mis, uh, misnumbered. Excuse me for that. Okay. Concept question, can a magnetic field change the kinetic energy of a charged particle? Huh, we found the kinetic energy of a charged particle moving through a magnetic field, but was that the result of the magnetic field? Well, let's think about it. See if you have an answer yourself, All right? Here's my answer. No, most definitely not. The magnetic field is always perpendicular to velocity. By definition, right-hand rule, okay? And thus, by another definition, the definition of work, which is that work equals force times displacement times cosine of the angle between the two, all right? Because that's a good thing that, to note, right? That the magnetic field is, has a sign in its calculation. Of course, work has a cosine. Well, then work tells us that the magnetic force does no work, the definition of work, because, and well, because in that case, right? Because theta is 90 degrees, what's cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. Zero, zero, zero. Okay? And if there's no work, then there could be no change in kinetic energy from the work energy theorem. All right? No change in kinetic energy. Okay? So it follows from definitions. Good. And, you know, another force that we've seen that does no work? The centripetal force. Centripetal forces, whether they're whether they're due to gravity or due to tension, any centripetal force does no work on the object or particle that the centripetal force is exerted on. Oh, that's interesting. So we kind of, so we see that the magnetic force is such a, a really fascinating natural force. It's naturally a centripetal force and never does work, thus never changes the kinetic energy of the charged particle. Now, you might say, but it's redirecting it. It's giving it an acceleration. Yes but it's not 
it's changing its speed. It's just changing the direction of the charged particle. And after all, kinetic energy isn't dependent on direction. It's just dependent on speed. Okay. Another concept question. What is the direction of the magnetic force on the proton shown? What would be the direction if the proton was replaced with an electron? Okay, so a few minutes ago, I promised that we talked about, we talked about how the right hand rule is limited to positive charges and what happens when there's a negative charge. Well, we're finally getting to that. Okay, so first of all, for part A of this concept question, you should just use the right hand rule. So make sure you can come up with an answer using your right hand and confirm the direction of force exerted on this moving charge particle in this particular magnetic field, which here points to the left. Okay, all right, got your answer? It is out of the page, okay? The force would be out of the page. But what about if we replaced this positive charge particle with a negative one? Well, in that case, electrons always feel force from a magnetic field in the opposite direction of protons. So we just have to switch it. We just get our result that we get with our right hand rule and then switch it 180 degrees. Just flip it the other way. So in that case, it would be into the page, okay? So if the proton is feeling a charge out of the page, then the electron would feel a, char a well, force into the page, okay? Now, alternatively, and this is kind of neat, you could actually use your left hand. Because if you use your left hand for electrons, you always get the right answer. Because, you get, because they, they work different, they're mirror images, mirror images of each other. So you use your left hand for electrons or any negative charge, and you use your right hand for any positive charge or current, okay? Or you just remember to always use your right hand and switch the, res switch the result for a negative charge. Okay. All right, another computation problem and kind of a neat application of magnetic fields because they're often used and applied in cyclotrons. Okay. So in a cyclotron, it takes a proton with a kinetic energy of 11 mega electron volts, a lot more, a lot more kinetic energy than the kinetic energy of the electron we, we saw in example one but anyway, 11 mega electron volts to efficient, efficiently change oxygen 18 nuclei into fluoride 18 nuclei, okay? If the magnetic field inside the cyclotron is 1.2 Tesla, which doesn't seem that big, but it actually is huge. Remember, after all, that the Earth's magnetic field is 10, you know, is on the order of 10 to the negative five Tesla. 1.2 is about 100,000 times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. And it's difficult to create magnetic fields this strong. Like the very strongest created magnetic fields in laboratories are maybe 10 Tesla, okay? So, but that, that being the case, so very, very strong uh, magnet in this cyclotron. What is the radius of the proton's orbit just before they exit the cyclotron? Right, just before they are ejected out to crash into those oxygen nuclei. Okay, so let's see. So upon, upon exiting, we want the kinetic energy of the positive proton to be 11 mega electron volts. All right, well, 11 mega electron volts is 11 million electron volts times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt, which gives us the kinetic energy, okay? the kinetic energy in joules so that we can solve for the velocity in meters per second, okay? So then we simply solve for the velocity of that positively charged proton, that's the P plus, in meters per second, and we get 45.9 million meters per second, or 4.59 times 10 to the seven meters per second, okay? Thus, if we go and then solve for um, the outer radius, Okay, using the centripetal force equation and setting that equal to, to the magnetic force with our now, our known value of velocity, we then, and then algebraically solve for that radius, we get, by plugging in the numbers, the following value, 40 centimeters. Okay, so it doesn't have to be particularly large, but that's the size of the cyclotron in order to have that much energy for that strength field. Okay, good. Okay. So now let's look at an example that involves, this is, are we on a type two here, type two problems, a, a problem that involves both electric fields and magnetic fields. And one of the most common ways you're gonna see that, the combination of electric fields and magnetic fields, is when their purpose is to stop the changing of direction of the charged particle. Because if we send a charged particle, like an electron, into an electric field, we know it's going to take a parabolic path. Okay, 
like a parabolic path. But if we also include a magnetic field, we can counteract that parabolic path and keep the electron moving straight, allowing it to glide on through, which has a lot of applications. That's how you make an electron gun for, for certain purposes, okay? So an electron moves through a region of crossed electric and magnetic fields. The electric field has a value of 2,340 volts per meter and is directed straight down, as shown, okay? The magnetic field has a value of 0.955 Teslas and is directed to the left, as shown. What must be the direction and magnitude of the electron's velocity v so that the electric force exactly cancels the magnetic force? Okay, well, I've drawn the direction answer in here, showing that the velocity must be out of the page. Okay, and you can confirm, confirm that with the right-hand rule. Confirm that the velocity coming out of the page for an electron exerts a force that is exactly opposite of the force that the electric field would exert on that same electron, okay? Because we know that the force from the electric field is going on an electron is going to be opposite the direction of the field. And we can show at the right-hand rule that the force from the magnetic field, if it points to the left, and the velocities out of the page is straight down, okay? And so that means that these two forces can cancel out and our electron can just continue uninterrupted as it moves out of the page towards you as the observer, okay? Our negatively charged electron, okay? So what we need to do then is actually find the value of V because we've already discussed this direction. And we do that by simply setting up the fact that the two forces must be equal in magnitude, okay? All right, and then the chart, the, um, well, the force from the electric field is simply QE, okay? And then the force from the magnetic field we now know is QVB. So that means if we simply solve for the velocity, it's going to be E over B, right? What, a, what an elegant result, okay? So electric field strength divided by magnetic field strength. Of course, the units do make sense, right? Because the electric field is Newtons per Coulomb. The magnetic field is Newtons per Coulomb um, per velocity. And so if it, it's in the denominator, then I would take the reciprocal of that. So then I would have coulombs, meters per second over newtons, the coulombs cancel, the newtons cancel, and we're just left with a velocity, okay? And here are our values, our two field strengths, and there's our velocity, 2,450 meters per second. A very slow electron compared to our other ones, okay? So what if the fields are not perfectly crossed like this for the goal of canceling out the effects of the force, right, having a net force that is zero, because that was the case in example four. In example five, what if they're not what if the net force is not zero? What happens then? Okay? Well it's a bit it's a bit more tricky to work with, but let's work through it. Okay? So a charged particle has a charge of negative 1.22 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs and a velocity with the following components: an x component of 4.38 times 10 to the 10 to the 6 meters per second, and a y component of 1.02 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. The particle enters a region of space with a magnetic field that is directed, well, with an x component of 1 times 10 to the negative 4 teslas and a y component of 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 4 teslas. Okay? So notice that the magnetic field has x and y components, as does the velocity. Okay? This region of space also has an electric field that points along the negative z axis with a field strength of 564 newtons per coulomb. Okay, so everything up to the electric field is X and Y, but the um, electric field is definitely not. It's three-dimensional. It's, it's along the Z-axis. And the question, what is the force acting on the particle at the instant it encounters the two fields? Well, let's see. All right, so here I've drawn a three-dimensional picture with X, Y, and Z-axis shown. I've shown an estimate of where the magnetic field would point in the XY plane and where the velocity would point in that same plane. All right, notice that I've also drawn the electric field um, supposed to be represented here as going into the page. And hopefully I made that clear by drawing the electric field right along the negative Z axis. So the electric field is going into the page. The resulting net force, we should expect it to come out of the page along the positive Z axis. Well, why is that? Well, if we think about the right-hand rule and the component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity, then we're going to get a force that comes 
that is going to be, well, actually in that case, we'll actually get a force that goes into the page, but it turns out that the electric field force is strong enough that it cancels out that force and it results in a net force out of the page. So it's not exactly obvious that the net force will come out of the page. We could have got either result, but again, it's because the force in the electric field overwhelms the force of the magnetic field, so the overall result is out of the page. Because if there was no electric field, then the force would be into the page, okay? And F net then would just be, well, a single force. It would just be the force for the magnetic field, okay? And that does come from the right-hand rule, okay? So let's find the values that we need. We need the magnitude of the velocity, which we'll use, um, or which we'll find using the Pythagorean theorem, right? So there's a result. The same thing with the magnetic field strength. We're going to find this magnitude given its two components, its x and y components, and there it is, okay? And we also want to find the angle between velocity and magnetic field. We're going to find that by finding the angle of the magnetic field, I'm zooming a bit on this, relative to the x-axis, which I call theta b, and the angle of the velocity relative to the x-axis, which I call theta v, okay? And so we're going to then acknowledge that theta is the difference between those two angles, which we can, can, fi can find, of course, with inverse tangent functions and the correct sides of the triangle with your old friend Sokotoa. Okay? All right, and here are, if we plug in the numbers, the same numbers that we used up here in the Pythagorean theorem, we end up with 84.2 degrees and 13.3 degrees um, for the magnetic field and the, um, the velocity respectively. And that gives us a difference between the two vectors of 70.9 degrees. Okay, looks good. And the magnitude of the magnetic force on the particle is, well, it's just QVB times sine theta, the theta that we found, right? And the V and the B that we found, right? So all these steps up here were just to find the quantities we needed, right? The only thing we already knew was Q, okay? Notice here, since I'm looking at magnitude, I just plug in Q, not negative Q, and I end up with a force of 5.16 times 10 to the negative eight Newtons, okay? And we know the direction by the opposite of the right-hand rule, and it's going to be into the page in the negative Z axis, okay? Now, and so now we know that then that the electric field is going to be counteracting that because the electric field, since it also points into the page, wants to push the electron or this negative charge, not electron, but a negative charge out of the page. So the two, the two resulting forces are going to be opposing each other. So let's find out which one wins. Although I've already given it away and told you that the electric field force ends up overpowering the magnetic field force. But we can think about the net force as being the sum of the magnetic field force and the electric field force. Okay, so Fb plus Qe. Plug in the value that we found for the magnetic field force. Plug in Q and E. Notice here, I do put the sign of Q. That's because I want to show that this force is going in the opposite direction of the negative Z direction, okay? And I get a negative result. What does a negative result tell me? Well, a negative result tells me that it is 180 degrees or anti-parallel or opposite of negative Z. So it tells me that it's in the positive Z direction, as shown in the picture. Okay, so good. All right, let's do another concept question. All right, this one is very much just a straightforward right-hand rule. The only, the only reason it's in here is because it's a segue to talking about current, because now I have a magnetic field and a wire that carries a current into the page, as denoted by the vector here. Okay, all right, I, of course, representing current. All right, do the right-hand rule. Make sure you got it. What's the direction of force? Up, just from the right-hand rule. Okay, now we can also apply the right-hand rule to this loop of a current carrying wire. And let's think about how that would work out, okay? So the red arrows shown represent forces, okay? And so in this case, this they're repelling each other. So there's a repulsion between this bar magnet and this current carrying loop of wire, okay? Based on this information, what is the current direction in the loop? Give the answer as, excuse me, clockwise or counterclockwise from the perspective of the magnetic, magnet south pole. So if you're looking from this side, would you see the current going this way or would you see it going that way? Okay, that's the question. So let's think about it. So first of all, we got the magnetic field. We know that magnetic fields external of the magnet all point towards the south po south pole. So that means that field lines would look like this. Now you might be you might think to yourself, well, can, can you draw a field line that goes from north like this and then like passes through and comes back in? 
In that case, that looks like that field is actually pointing exactly the opposite direction. It's pointing, you know, kind of straight to the um, to the left rather than down and to the right. Well, that's true, except that that field would have effectively cancel itself out because every field that's going in that direction would cancel one by that direction, I mean to the left, would cancel with an equal magnitude component that's going to the right, okay? So these are all the ones that didn't pass through the loop, okay, on the way through as well as on the way back, but instead were the larger loops of the magnetic field that only passed once and thus did not cancel each other out, okay? So you know it's only the magnetic field lines that are coming into the South Pole that do not cancel. Furthermore, we only care about the vertical component of the field lines because the component in this direction, the horizontal component of the field lines, are not going to contribute to the force, okay? So the X component of the field lines do not matter, only the Y component of the field lines are actually going to contribute to the force shown, okay? So the magnetic field has a Y component that exerts a force on the top and bottom currents that is in the direction shown, okay? Into the page here, out of the page at the bottom. Okay, so the top current is into the page, the bottom current is out of the page. All right, thus, from the south pole, the current would be seen to flow in the clockwise direction. All right, so it would flow in the clockwise direction like this. Okay, now, that's a lot to deal with, because also, like, why did we not consider the current along this line, right? The current along the flat parts because that would experience a force. It would experience a force either into the page or out of the page, whether you're thinking about the current in the front and the back. Well, it turns out because those forces cancel each other out, okay? And the whole, and you know, you have to worry about only the component that matters. And you have to consider the whole business with the field lines that I discussed, why we're only considering the field lines that were large enough to only pass through the loop once. So what's interesting about this is that although we can definitely use the right-hand rule involving the force exerted on moving charges, or in this case, a current, it is a little not that well suited for more complex situations like this, like a loop. And it will turn out that in future lectures, when we talk about Faraday's law and Lenz's law applying to electromagnetic induction, we're going to have really quick ways to come up with the same result. All right, so look forward to that. Okay, so onward to example six, which of course is going to involve a wire that carries a current. A copper wire of a length of 25 centimeters is in a magnetic field of 36 millitesla. If it has a mass of 11 grams, what is the minimum current through the wire that would cause a magnetic force equal to its weight? So we have an equilibrium situation here, all right? So minimum current means that we can assume that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the current because otherwise we would need more current because some of it effectively wouldn't matter. Right? So we want, we want the maximum force case. Maximum force comes when the vectors are perpendicular. Okay? So as mentioned, we want equilibrium. We want the magnetic field force to balance out and equal the gravitational force. So we want BIL, that's the magnetic field force. And of course, that's because sine of 90 degrees isn't included because it just equals one. So we don't need to include it. And we need that force to equal the gravitational force MG because we're assuming that we're on the surface of Earth here. So G is just going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. So then it's simply a matter of solving for the current, plugging in the values, all of which we know, and finding that the current that is necessary is 12 amps, okay? So that's a fairly large current, but not by any means um, huge. And running that current through this particular wire would effectively, effectively allow it to levitate. So you can definitely get levitation through, um, you know, through current running through, um, well, um, through a wire, as long as you have a external magnetic field that keeps going, okay? So you, you, can't, you can't levitate without this field. Now, could you use Earth's magnetic field to levitate? Yes, you can, but you have to run huge values of current, right? You need, you need like 100,000 amps to use something that is on the order of 10 to the negative five Teslas, okay? So a wire in a uniform magnetic field of 0.35 Teslas carries a current of 3.5 amps. If the magnitude of the magnetic force per unit length on the wire is 0.278 newtons per meter, what is the angle between the magnetic field and the current? So the only thing's different here is that here we have force per length instead of just force, and we are going to acknowledge that we have an angle other than 90 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So in this, in this situation, our vectors are the current vector and the magnetic field vector. 
and we care about the angle between the two. All right, here we have the magnetic field force per length of the wire equal to the field, the magnetic field magnitude times the current magnitude times sine of the angle between the two, okay? So then it's a matter of solving for that angle, plugging in the values, and getting 13.1 degrees. All right, now there are other solutions. This is just the smallest. And of course I said there's other solutions because you could have other values of sine that would give you the same, you know, um, the same result, okay? Or sine of another angle would give you the same result because of course that's this is the balance that we need to meet. And those would correspond to an angle where the current is in this direction. So thus the angle here would be well, it'd be 180 degrees minus theta, okay? So we'll call this theta prime, and it'd be 180 degrees minus the theta that we solved for, okay? All right. Our final two examples are going to involve current carrying loops and torque, okay? So a circular coil with a radius of 0.25 meters has 143 turns and is in a uniform magnetic field. If the orientation of the coil is varied through all possible positions, the maximum torque on the coil by, by, by the magnetic force is 0.29 newton meters. When the current in the coil is 2.7 milliamps, what is the magnitude of the magnetic field? Okay. Well, here's the equation for the torque exerted on a current carrying loop with multiple loops, okay, in a magnetic field. All right. And the maximum torque occurs when theta is 90 degrees. All right, and we tried, it says here, we tried all possible positions and we found a maximum torque. That means we can assume that theta is 90 degrees, okay? And then that means we simply can solve for the magnetic field strength with our given value of torque, our given value of current, and calculating our area based off the radius and the fact that it's a circle, okay? And of course, the number of loops. So here we can see, we're just plugged it, plug in the values. This is just pi r squared for the, the, the surface area of our enclosed circle. And 143, again, is the number of turns, all right? And that gives us a value for the field of 3.83 Teslas, which is a huge field, as I mentioned before, but we are getting a rather large torque for such a small current, okay? All right, finally, example nine. Current is shown flowing through a square loop of wire with a side length of 85.5 centimeters. The normal vector of the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field it'd be out of the page, pointing, pointing towards you. The magnitudes of the current and the magnetic field are 4.15 amps and 712 microteslas, respectively. If a force is applied a distance of 12 centimeters from the axis, here's our axis right to the middle, then how large and on what side of the axis must this force be in order for the loop to not rotate? Okay, so here's L, that's the side length, all right? Here are the forces of the magnetic field shown on two different sides of the loop, just for um, interest. Here is the external force that we're gonna be solving for, and here is the distance from the axis that's given as 12 centimeters, okay? All right, and confirm that these directions of magnetic field force on these two sections of current carrying wire make sense to you based on the right-hand rule. And then let's reflect quickly on the fact that I'm not considering the forces up here from the magnetic field, mag representing magnetic field, because the forces on the two components of the wire that run horizontally, well, those forces would just cancel out, okay? So the magnetic torque is magnetic field times current times cross-sectional area. In this case, we don't have to worry about the angle because it's 90 degrees, okay? And here are the values plugged in, which gives us a torque value of 2.16 times 10 to the negative three Newton meters, okay? And to prevent rotation, we need equilibrium. So we need the sum of torques to be zero. We need the net torque to be zero. So if we set up a net torque equation, we're gonna have the torque due to the magnetic field minus the torque due to the external force, the one we're solving for, and we need that to be equal to zero, okay? To maintain equilibrium and prevent rotation. And we don't have to worry about torque from gravity due to the location of the rotational axis. Since the rotational axis runs through the geometric center of this uniform density rod here, or you know, uniform density object, wire loop, it's the, the gravity will always balance itself out, so it's irrelevant to the problem. All right, so here we are setting up 
or plugging our values into our equilibrium equation, which will allow us to solve for f external, the external force. And we find that it is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 2 newtons. And as far as which side it's on, well, that actually depends on whether we assume that the force is down or up. I meant to specify that the problem. So if we assume that the force is pointing down, then it must be applied to the right in order to prevent rotation. OK, because we need we need it to go down into the page to prevent the loop, which wants to rotate this way. OK, so if we apply a force there, that distance with that strength, we can prevent it from rotating. OK, all right. So I hope this lecture introducing magnetism and the way it exerts a force on moving charged particles has been both interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.